Takashi Kotegawa became a bit of a celebrity in Japan after profiting to the tune of $20 million when a misplaced sell order by a Mizuho Securities employee birthed one of the most spectacular trades of all time. He did interviews and went on a number of shows over the course of the following four years, but vanished from the spotlight around late 2009. But before the world had ever heard of Takashi Kotegawa, a niche group of traders on the online message board Nichanel, that is, two channel in English, regaled at and imbibed the wisdom of a user going by the pseudonym of BNF. Takashiko Tegawa and BNF are one and the same person, and today we'll be going over his trading strategy. The site no longer exists in its original form, but BNF's posts have been preserved all over the internet, allowing us to carry out an in-depth study of his strategies. BNF's early trading career was set against the backdrop of the unforgiving bear market of 2001 and 2002. He credits this as one of the reasons for his success, as he believes it is easier to make money during a down market by betting on short-term rebounds. Here's what he has to say about this strategy. When going for a short-term rebound, what he should be focusing on is moving average divergence. Naturally, the greater the degree of divergence, the greater the odds the stock goes back up, but the threshold for a good buy depends a great deal on prevailing market conditions. In the bear market of 01 and 02, I would only look at stocks at least 20% below the 25-day moving average. 35% being a somewhat safe level to buy at. The price would then surge, at which point I'd close the position at a profit. At this stage, the divergence would narrow from say 35% to 15%, but after a while it would once again fall 30% plus below the moving average, restarting the cycle. The thing is though, this dynamic started changing around the latter half of last year, that is 2003, with stocks a mere 15% below the 25-day moving average, rebounding right away. Now that I think about it, recently there haven't even really been that many opportunities to make use of this moving average divergence strategy to begin with. Rebound levels are highly sensitive to prevailing market sentiment, so finding the right threshold requires a bit of a judgment call from traders. You can't treat all stocks the same based solely on the divergence numbers. First, you need to develop a feel for each sector's general dynamics. Stocks in certain sectors are prone to diverge more strongly from the 25-day moving average. You should therefore be more prudent in determining at what level to buy. Other stocks tend to rebound more quickly, meaning you can be more adventurous with those. This is of course a bird's eye overview, because divergence trends can also vary for different groups of stocks within the same sector. Here's a snapshot from the bear market of 2001. Electric machinery, precision instruments, retail, Wholesalers, banking, securities, communications, services. These sectors tended to diverge materially from the 25-day moving average. The same for penny stocks, stocks on the Nikkei OTC, and on mothers, which at the time still had few listings. For example, in the retail sector, you'd have names with low minimum purchase lot sizes of 100 shares. These were companies that had their stock price skyrocket in 1999. This group of stocks would show significant divergence from the 25-day moving average. So for me, I'd start thinking of maybe placing a bid once the price had fallen between 22% and 28% from the 25-day moving average. Same story with service sector stocks, with a 22% to 30% threshold and between 20% and 30% for names in the banking sector. 
On the Nikkei OTC, the threshold was between 22% and 32% for post-dot-com crash IPOs in sectors other than IT, and between 25% and 45% for IT stocks. For stocks listed on mothers, the range was from 28% to 60%. I'd add these stocks to my watch list at these levels. Then the U.S. markets would maybe drop overnight, leading to further declining price action on the Tokyo Stock Exchange the following morning, and that's when I'd finally take the plunge. Of course, these ranges are completely meaningless in a bull market, as these were companies that had seen surging stock prices in 1999 and in the year 2000, followed by an unforgiving bear market in 2001. The next bear market will probably see action in other market sectors at different divergence levels. Particularly vivid in my memory is the December 2001 crash in penny stocks. This particular group of stocks included fairly liquid names with a long history, so under normal circumstances you wouldn't hesitate to buy at 25% below the 25-day moving average. However, penny stocks are priced low, so a 1 yen movement has a disproportional effect on the divergence rate. Furthermore, you'd see a large number of companies diverging 30% or more from the 25-day moving average, so this caused me to pass on what would be considered a buying opportunity under normal circumstances. Instead, I bought heavily at levels between minus 35% and 65%. Upon doing so, the price rebounded rather quickly for a lot of these names, jumping by 50%, and even in some cases doubling over the course of two or three trading days. Had I bought these at minus 25%, there's a chance my losses could have been catastrophic. I'm generally pretty skeptical about these things, but I do find BNF to be a man of refreshing candor and clarity in these posts. His ability to process vast amounts of data in order to derive meaningful information about price movements gives him an edge over other market participants. In fact, by 2007, he would be holding between 30 to 70 positions at any one time and have an accurate and up-to-date mental image of the price charts for around 600 to 700 securities. Needless to say, this is an astounding feat of memory and executive function. Okay, but what about in bull markets? What's his strategy then? Well, I'm glad you ask. Here's what BNF has to say about his bull market strategy, taken from an interview he did in 2006. Stocks work in mysterious ways, going up and down based not on fundamentals, but rather on price action in the U.S. and futures markets, and on overall market sentiment. Take steel-making companies, for example. When the market's strong, the core companies in the sector tend to rise in tandem with the index. There's a pattern to this dynamic. So let's say one or more of Sumitomo Metal Industries, Nippon Steel, Kobe Steel, and JFE Holdings start rising in tandem with the Nikkei 225 index. These core companies don't go up instantaneously all at the same time, as usually one or more ends up lagging the others. That's a good time to place your bid. You learn to spot these opportunities over time, after watching day in and day out price movements across a wide range of companies. Here's an example. Let's say you start with a sharp fall in the tech sector. Then maybe this group of stocks recoups some of its earlier losses, causing the Nikkei 225 to rise. Market sentiment has now turned bullish, causing companies in the steelmaking industry to start rising in tandem with the index. Ultimately, my success doesn't come from skill, but rather I was a product of the times. Everything comes down to the prevailing market environment. 
He's obviously being self-effacing here, but we can appreciate from his posts the fluidity of the market and just how crucial it is to think holistically and make adjustments to one's strategy along the way.